At this time, uh, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, and you saw his bio and information about him on the uh, uh, on the screen. Jim Witter works for the Wood County Park District, and we'll be talking about native plants in the yard. And Jim is our vice president and program chair. So, Jim. Oh, yes. No problem. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks so much uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, I now have uh, some familiar faces out in the audience and, you know, working with Wood County Parks. Uh, often you, you'd think that, um, you know, having uh, strangers would be more in intimidating to the audience, but a lot of the staff feel like either their peers or people they know actually makes it more difficult. But since, since I'm uh, a seasoned professional, like none of that phases me. It's gonna, it's gonna be great, but uh, yes, glad to have you uh, all out here uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, talking about native plants uh, in the yard, uh, it's something that kind of uh, my journey a little bit, the bio, uh, it all started, had the spark bird, kind of the bird watching uh, with the belted kingfisher in second grade. So that was my thing. And it wasn't until kind of I moved on my professional career, joined the parks and a part of our mission at the Wood County Parks and as well as here at Metro Parks Toledo where we are tonight is that conservation mission, kind of restoring habitats and providing all these places uh, for people to enjoy, but also to uh, give uh, animal uh, habitat. And it, it's something that I educated folks about and talked about, but then, you know, I come home to my little yard in West Toledo, got a little postage stamp and the lawn and things and kind of inherited some traditional landscaping and think, well, no, it'd be, be nice to like participate, you know, kind of more like personally. And it's, it's good to educate and talk about it, but like, I wanna, I wanna really try this. And uh, maybe uh, similar with uh, some of you, I'll get into uh, my story. Uh, you know, there was some level of trepidation, like, oh, I, I don't know, like, what are people gonna think when I start digging up my yard? You know, what, what is my family gonna think? What is my wife gonna think when I start getting the, the, the shovel out and start digging around? So. Uh, there's that uh, certain level of, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if I'm up for this, but uh, as a kind of a, maybe a theme of the presentation is you just got to like do it. You just got to go for it. And, you know, uh, some of you, if you're gardeners or even master gardeners, you might be very circumspect about planning out. And I did a little bit of that, but sometimes a lot of it is just like, ah, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to stuff things in the ground. They'll live or they'll die. If they die, I'll get more at the plant sales. It's always still, yeah. So, so yeah, um, and uh, I should uh, say either for, for folks there uh, on Zoom and here uh, in person. So as a bird watcher, it's a connection to that first uh, photo. Of course, I have, have to represent Wood County Parks, uh, their program coordinator at Wood County Parks. But uh, does anyone recognize, I know some of you know the, know the answer too, but does anyone recognize that there's a connection, a hint for the non people, you know, never, know nothing about native plants, there's a connection to uh, a bird connection for that flowering plant there on the screen. Does anyone know, just shout out, what is it? Yes, yes, everyone, like, yes, yes. That, like with the kids sometimes to, to get them involved, let's all say it together. Cardinal flower. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yes, I, I do that. I do that for, for my preschoolers. Yes, repeat. And so, yes, for our state bird, cardinal flower, and a lovely uh, wetland plant, uh, really nice. Uh, and again, connection back to birds, of course, to my bird watcher. Hummingbirds, uh, among other uh, critters, love uh, this plant. Uh, so, yeah, we'll uh, jump uh, right into it. Also, if people have questions uh, on Zoom, go ahead and ah, here we go. Ask them in the chat. Yes, we'll yes. Address thank you. Thank you, John. So yeah, yeah, I think you, you caught that. If you have any questions there uh, on Zoom, you can type them into uh, the chat and John will see them and he can uh, bring them up. Uh, yes. So uh, we've got, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tonight uh, is uh, kind of the, uh, the story about like why, you know, why native plants? You have all these, you know, traditional garden plants, landscaping plants, which can be lovely to use in your gardens. You probably have some of them, maybe your own landscaping, but native plants are a little bit different. And, you know, sometimes, for, especially for folks that aren't, aren't familiar, like, well, what, what is this big deal? Everyone seems really excited about this one. I'm excited, so I'm up here talking about it. But, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the whole deal with them? And as I mentioned, you're talking about my own story, how kind of I got started, and hopefully maybe you can get started. If nothing else, 
Maybe it'll be a, a goofy uh, dad hobby. Like I'll get into the dad hobby thing. It'll be a goofy hobby. Like that was entertaining. That was interesting. That guy kind of talked about that. But hopefully maybe some of you either on Zoom or here in person might uh, add, uh, get interested in it uh, yourself. Like about my story. And then things also talk about things to uh, consider, uh, different considerations uh, involving sometimes uh, the soil, the types of plants. Uh, also uh, always involves people. Uh, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your household, uh, those things, things to consider. And then um, we're excited as uh, I kind of, uh, of course, I am a nature nerd. And here you are. I am assuming that you are some level of nature nerd. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here on Zoom or in person. But uh, yes, it feels like there's kind of a growing uh, community. Uh, sometimes it seems that way. And you kind of get out, you know, or outside of the bubble and realize, oh, people don't really know about this, but uh, there's more and more opportunities, it feels like, to get plants. Uh, you won't find necessarily at Walmart, probably don't want to get them native plants from Walmart, not a thing. So we know the places, though, where uh, you can get them, some coming up in a couple weeks. We'll get to that. Um, and yes, getting connected to a big part of uh, kind of native plants is getting connected uh, to the community of folks, which is, I do feel like, lots of energy, lots of growth kind of growing here in Northwest Ohio, Toledo area, and even kind of regionally, nationally, uh, about native plants that are unique to their different, uh, you know, ecosystems kind of around uh, the country. And we'll talk about, yeah, right here in Northwest Ohio. So yeah, answering kind of that first uh, bullet point, you know, why uh, should uh, you consider putting their, uh, these in your yard? Why are we excited about them at the Wood County Parks and Toledo Naturalists and all uh, different organizations, uh, they're adapted uh, to living in our kind of our local conditions. So they're very uh, resilient. Uh, and once you get them established, we'll talk a little bit more about that. They do need definitely some uh, loving care, some attention, especially as they're getting started. But once they really are kind of established, they're very hardy uh, and can tolerate, you know, droughty conditions. Some of them really uh, it's kind of good for me. I tend to kind of over attend to them. Some of them, you really can't overwater them. They like to be wet. Some of them will grow out of standing water. So you can keep watering, watering them, yay. Um, so, so yeah, uh, definitely they are adapted for both wet. You can also, if your soil is very dry, we'll get more into that, but yes, they're adapted for living here in this uh, local area. And they are the most useful to wildlife. Uh, you might see maybe if you're some, you know, more traditional plants, your, your roses or hostas or things like that, which are, are good, you know, insects do use those. They can come to those, they can, you know, pollinate and get some use out of those plants. However, uh, the plants that they are best adapted to and have the most kind of ecosystem interconnections. So it could be uh, a moth species that uh, chews on the leaves or all of our pollinators, uh, the birds that eat them. The plants that are kind of most adapted and are most healthy and useful uh, are our native uh, plants, most useful for, for a wide variety of wildlife, which is why we're so excited about them. And also kind of the, the part uh, about native plants in your yard is that I'll kind of get into a section here in a little bit uh, talking about kind of the, the amount of acreage of kind of either rural areas or urban areas, suburban areas that really aren't uh, very well utilized in terms of native plants. So, you know, good for people, nice for wandering around, even you know, playing, playing ball and sports and things like that. But there could be opportunities to increase habitat right here in places that maybe you know, folks don't think of as like, this is the people place. This isn't, you know, this isn't habitat. But um, there's definitely an opportunity there is kind of exciting to see and attract wildlife to areas that we don't think of as being like wildlife zones. And we can add that with uh, native plants. And I kind of I basically covered it there. Parks and preserves here at Metro Parks Toledo, they have so many, you know, thousands of acres, which is spectacular. They do a great service uh, for wildlife, for serving people. Uh, and really, sometimes we have that dichotomy between, you know, there's the people, there's the wildlife. Really, we're all inhabiting the space uh, that's important for us to take care of. And you know, to have these plants, have clean water, we all need that, both the animals and the human animals that, that live here. But um, we can't do it all. It's great to have these natural spaces for people to visit and for animals to use, but there's still all these areas, even in urban areas, your neighborhoods, like I mentioned, where we can really kind of enhance that value and create more and more uh, habitat. And so now going from kind of the why about native plants, moving to uh, kind of the, the why for kind of for me, why for me uh, personally, and I kind of mentioned that 
you know, I talk about this at work, you know, you know, kind of wave the flag, native plant, that's great. Then you come back to your house like, yeah, this is, it's just a little, little yard with grass and lawn right here in West Toledo. Like, I want to, I want to do this. I want to give it a, a try. And uh, yes, it, it can be trying something new. You can kind of scratch your creative itch or just, uh, yes, if, if you're looking to, you know, you're kind of bored, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bored, you know, maybe I've recently retired or the kids have left the house. Now, what should I do? Yeah, let's just start going, you know, all in on native plants, just start putting things uh, in the ground. So trying something new uh, and different. Um, and like I kind of talked about it, it pretty good length, all of these kind of these uh, graphics there, these pictures, these different examples of urban spaces that might be underutilized. And you might see all these pictures uh, maybe, of course, uh, if you're a nature nerd, you might see them all be like, yeah, that's a good place for a native plant. How about that? Wonder what I can find there. It might appear to just kind of people generally like, oh, that no, that's not nature. That's gross, like weavy stuff. Like that's not nature. That's that's people, people space. And so, you know, just look at those, you know, the railway verges, you know, even brownfields. Yeah, brownfield, that's contaminated and gross. You can do restoration uh, projects. Sometimes even in like Southern Ohio, they have these reclaimed mines and places that have kind of been really heavily utilized by people. And they spring back uh, amazingly when they're invested in and you know, seeded with native plants and prairies. Uh, power line, uh, right of ways, even vacant lots. Uh, an example of, of uh, that locally is the Wild Toledo program through Toledo Zoo, that they've taken some vacant lots and kind of just you know planted them to a small little prairie. So adding uh, value where there might just be kind of a, a, a kind of vacant lawn that you have to keep mowing, the city has to invest in that, invest all the gasoline and then the people power. Uh, now you just have a nice little uh, prairie uh, there and always takes, uh, I'll talk about, take some education. At first, when it's first starting out, it might look like, what's the city doing? It looks like a bunch of weeds, what's going on? But as it starts to mature and bloom, you kind of see the uh, full picture there. Uh, and yes, of course there, uh, and this might not be something that, uh, you know, it applies to all people, though it, it, it can be as we explained uh, the kind of definition. I have children, maybe you know children, neighborhood children. You know, I talked to uh, Hal Mann, one of our wild ones, uh, kind of a, a native plant conservation organization that's nationwide, has local chapter. He talks to the, to the neighborhood kids. Uh, even if you don't have your own kids, maybe you have grandkids, maybe you have neighborhood kids, maybe you just have interested passersby, like I do sometimes in the front yard. So yes, those are all, uh, yeah, I wanted to share it with my kids uh, personally too. Uh, my story. And yes, and so there I am in my yard. Uh, the context there in the top picture is that was back when uh, it was the Corona shutdown. And we're like, well, we can't have people out coming to programs to the parks. What do I do? Well, I could talk from my yard about, about my plants. And you can see not, not very impressive. That's in the springtime. Everything is still all that energy is stored down in the roots. Uh, and as one of my native plant mentors, Rick Barraclo, told me, Jim, you, even though you plant them, maybe you plant them when they're not, you know, they're not, they're dormant. It's in the roots there. If the roots are good, they will grow back. And sure enough, as it greens up, you have all your plants growing up. And that, uh, that bottom picture is the, uh, that's when I kind of graduated that first, that top picture, just have that little space between uh, the house and uh, the fence. That was where I first started. Don't want anybody to see it. It could be scary. It could look weird. I don't want to be judged. And so kind of hide it back there. And then you're kind of pretty happy. You start getting kind of bold. Like, yeah, I think it's, it's going okay. I'm going to go to the front yard. See, see if anybody, you know, you know challenges me on having my, my weedy yard. And I'll talk yeah, more about that. More, more about the, my wife is good at the uh, storytelling uh, part. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And so that's the uh, rain garden uh, in the front yard there on the, the bottom picture. That's uh, Jojo, uh, the pelican there, our little uh, mascot that I got from my, my grandparents when, when they passed on. But uh, yes, so in that, uh, even that, uh, you can see the cardinal flower there, we got the great the cone flower coming up, I think a little bit of the swamp milkweed, but that has really, it's filled in very well. Uh, my mom is here, she can attest, she, she's seen it. it. It's like a, it's like a jungle. Now it's like it's the best kind of a jungle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, yes, yeah, thank you, yes. And so just, uh, yes, it's very, it's very well filled in and uh, is always kind of like ever changing uh, and we'll talk more about that. But yeah, so uh, for example, my context is always different from where you are, whether they're in your rural landscape, maybe you have lots and lots of acres, which is great. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can engage with native plants. If you have acreage, you can see, I don't really have so much acreage. I, I don't know what kind of acre, a little tiny poster stamp, but hey, it's, it's, 
yeah, it's the yard and I'm, I'm doing something there. The soil type is pretty kind of loamy, kind of a medium soil, maybe a pretty well-drained. And you can see there it's getting some sun there in the late afternoon. In the morning, it kind of starts out in shade. And uh, we'll get to a section there uh, in the presentation where we have kind of a list of plants to, I know it's kind of an, not an exhaustive list, but lots of plants talking about which ones like sun, which ones like shade. And like I said, uh, good things to go by if you really want to, you know, to see if you can try a plant, you can always go for it, put it in there. Sometimes even as, uh, if it's not the happiest growing there, you can like will it to live by like watering it a lot or just kind of really attending to it. But yeah, those are some uh, little things uh, that are context of my yard there. And of course, uh, a lot about the, the story and kind of doing this. I, yeah, I, I, I did some planning. I visited some yards. Um, but uh, yeah, along the way, you just kind of like make make some mistakes there. And that's all right. And so the first mistake uh, I made that uh, when I started to put in the plants, uh, there are different ways to kind of kill off your turf grass. That grass, you're like, okay, I want to get rid of it. Uh, one of the ways it seems like a lot of people use is just by shading it out with like cardboard. You just like put cardboard down there. And sometimes uh, that cardboard can even kind of like mulch it up, you know, into the ground or even just to cover it up. I just went wild with like, uh, it's like a hoe, which are like just kind of chopping up the yard, which it, it did, it kind of like, you know, uh, tilled up a lot of the grass. However, with that, it, it was not a perfect system. We still had grass popping up you know, here and there. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the, the, the kind of cool season grass is still here and there popping up. So, so yeah, may, maybe a, a little bit uh, better at killing off uh, the turf grass for the, uh, when I got to the, the rain garden, I did have uh, actually a, a shovel or a sod cutter. Never tried a sod cutter, but it's pretty effective. You can even rent those for Home Depot to get rid of the, your sod, uh, your, your uh, yes, your lawn there. Uh, also, when I was putting in the, right, those plants, uh, I was kind of digging close to the foundation when the folks from, right, the old, I forget the name of the, the, the program, but old houses uh, in Toledo they can kind of visit and kind of, and they were noticing like, yeah, your grading is kind of weird here. What, what happened here? Like, oh, yeah, right. That, that might have been when I was digging around for the garden and can now have the water going back toward the house. Like, that's not good. You, you want to have the water going away and away from the house. Like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, th things like that. Just want to want to be careful. I know we talk about rain gardens, not having the rain garden too close to the house or going to have that water kind of, you know, getting down too close to the house when that bit going, getting, going away. Um, and so, yes, something to think about. And uh, native plants, uh, they are uh, great. Uh, you know, even that picture on the kind of the top left there, that's common wolfweed. And it is a lovely plant. You can see a nice bloom. It smells nice. Have that kind of aromatherapy thing going on. However, there are some native plants. I can see some people nodding. Like, they, I was really into like, oh, milkweed. Milkweed is good. And it, it is good. But some of them are really aggressive. And they're like, okay, the milkweed's there. And then it's over there, and that's, uh, and that's everywhere. Like, ah, okay, got a little bit carried away with the, the common milkweed. So sometimes, uh, yes, even with the common milkweed, now I'm just pulling it up. Like, I, I, it's great that you're doing that thing, but I don't want you there. So even your native plants can become become weeds. So I would suggest maybe, um, yeah, you could put your uh, milkweed in like a planter or even plant other species, swamp milkweed, not nearly as aggressive, um, a butterfly milkweed, different species of milkweed. So. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, putting your plants in certain locations and trying to manage that. And more bad, bad planning, it seemed like that lower left picture, you have a nice full uh, spice bush, uh, it was just nice native shrub. And I was excited about uh, spice bush, a good kind of a spring blooming plant where you don't have a lot of spring bloomers. I put it in the in the front yard, it's kind of more of a woodland plant. It, it seemed like it, it was not happy there. It was just too exposed uh, to, to the elements. Uh, maybe got a little bit too much sun, don't know for sure, but uh, yeah, it, it didn't like it there. It, it did not thrive. And uh, it, it, I still, I still have it. I transplanted it to like towards the back. It, it never like sustains any growth. It kind of dies back every year, a little spring, but yeah, there it is. So, so yes, um, sometimes just didn't plan for the plant in the right spot, but yeah, that's, that's okay. You learn from that. Yes. in the accents. So yeah, there's the daughter, Natalie over there. She's been the source of a, of a couple uh, accidents. So uh, I decided, you know, we, we, you know, involved the kids. She uh, did help with that uh, rain garden. Saw on the last uh, picture with my mom. Uh, I remember uh, it was excellent planning too. I waited 
till the fall, good planting time. However, uh, uh, we waited a uh, long enough into November. Your, your daylight starts to get very short there. So we decided this is the time I have my plants. Uh, it was a rainy Tuesday evening. Literally, it's like dark. It's like getting dark. And there we are in the mud, like putting the plants in that garden. So, so yeah, great, great planning after work. But um, so the accident with, with, with Natalie, I was really excited. I wanted to try, I got some uh, lupin from a native nursery and lupin's kind of particular, but I really wanted to give it such a, it's kind of a, a neat plant. So I, I'm gonna go for, for lupin. And I think I, I put it in the ground with her help and she was kind of digging around. And I was looking around, but I couldn't find lupin. I was like, Natalie, what happened? And she's like, huh? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I never did find the lupin. She dug, she dug it, she dug it up, it was buried. And uh, it was funny, I was like, oh man, I am really like, I'm really kind of, worked up about this. I got, ugh, gosh. But I, I was like, okay, can't, this is not the time. Like you have to maintain that parental control, which is always uh, evasive. I was like, no, no, can't get really worked up about this. Like, all right, this, this. so, so uh, yes, we lost that. Also uh, another accident she had, we were cutting back our, um, our kind of dead growth this spring. And uh, she was cutting back in you know, a lot of the dead growth and the, she got to the button bush, which also kind of looked dormant. It was just starting to get buds. And she's like, oh, this looks dead and chopped that thing to the ground. I was like, oh, yeah, not, not that one. However, as, as I found, it was kind of interesting. The button bush really loved that. It came back really strong. Some of you are like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. I was like, eh, that's probably not good. I don't know if it's gonna survive. It was like, yeah, that's fine. And so I think she actually, her happy mistake actually led, it, it was good for the button push to chop it down. It's a little bit, a little bit of chopping sometimes. Some plants, uh, yes, uh, prefer that even. And yeah, more positive. I talked a little bit about this uh, creativity. You can just, yeah, uh, design your, we uh, have resources towards the end, including wild ones that I, I'm pointing back. Who are you pointing to? Kim, Kim Smith is, uh, Kim, what, what is, are you a, a board member or just, I know you are a member. Yeah, board yeah. member. Yes, board, board member, the plant sale committee. Fear not, Kim. I mean, we're we're going to get there. We're going to get the get to the plant I sale. Trust you. <laughs> <laughs> trust you. <laughs> we'll dive in front of the Zoom. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, yes, we'll, we'll take control of this. We missed the plant sale, but yes, you can be creative. And there's lots of designs. So it's like about like kind of help with designs through wild ones. I think the Toledo Zoo has a little kind of design, uh, a kind of assistance plan, or I can just sort of do like what I do is like, I'm just going to put stuff well, based about where I like the colors and my son likes orange. I'm going to get butterfly milkweed and I'll put it over here. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, along with the creativity, experimenting. Uh, sometimes you just want to like, eh, I want to see what happens. So, yes, experiment, learning by doing it is kind of very hands on type of thing. You're experimenting and always learning, even I think as much as you learn, there are always kind of interesting things you're observing, even after you've been maybe gardening for a little bit and watching how things interact and where plants, what plants do. So that's that's kind of neat. And right, sharing it with others. So we have our intergenerational, ah, oh, that's nice. Sharing it with others, um, sharing it with uh, with your with your friends, with your your neighbors, uh, family, uh, right, passersby, anyone you can accost, like, ah, oh, yes, yeah. Talk about native plants. Some people, that's their thing. Some people, it's just, again, a weird hobby. That's all right. It's, I feel like it's a, it's a part of being, we have to embrace our inner weirdness as, as naturalists. Like that, that's a part of it. That's a part of us and not going to apologize for, for that. Yeah, that, that weirdness. And so I, I basically, uh, I kind of stole this slide from uh, Doug Tallamy, who is kind of a uh, professor at the University of Delaware, as well as a kind of a native plant advocate and author. Um, he is, I did learn, uh, yes, from Kate Mason Wolf, also a, a member of the Plant Sale Committee. I'm pretty sure I get that right. Yes, yes. Um, uh, she told me that Doug Tallamy, who I kind of based the slide on, is coming to uh, University of Finley, blanked out on, on when that is, but coming up. Yes, University of Finley is going to be presenting. But um, this is uh, kind of the slides talking about Lawn to native plants that kind of introduced uh, earlier in the presentation, but there's around 40 million, million acres of lawn in the United States. And I'd say, oh, okay. Um, so lawn in the context of uh, a kind of ecosystems and wildlife, it, it's kind of like a, a desert in the terms of, it's just not very useful to much. Uh, I'd say useful to uh, Canada geese, it really seems like lawn. They, they really enjoy it. It's very low, you can see all the predators. They love lawn, that's great, good for them. Uh, Eastern cottontail rabbit, also seems to love the lawn, maybe for the same reasons. I can eat, nothing's gonna sneak up on me really fast. This is spectacular. Rest of the animals, 
not so much. Don't, don't like it uh, too much. And so um, while a, uh, long, acreage of lawn can be good for you know human purposes, probably all of us, many of us do have some parts of our yard is lawn. Uh, it's uh, trying to introduce uh, more of that lawn, kind of like kind of co-opt some of that lawn. Maybe it's just kind of hanging out there towards a more useful kind of uh, ecosystem, kind of a friendly, animal friendly, uh, wildlife friendly a type of uh, habitat. And so planting half of that acreage, so just 20 million acres of lawn uh, to, uh, to native plants uh, would be larger than several of our national parks. Now, of course, that, 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 that won't happen. And I don't know, you can even get into some good debate, like, I don't know, is that, do we want to do that, turn, turn that much acreage? But it just does give you an idea of all of this lawn, and probably there is some of it, you know, we're not going to turn all of our baseball diamonds and our, our soccer fields, you know, into a native habitat, but there are maybe some lawn areas, like, that's, it could be like anything, it's just kind of hanging out there in what we kind of societally perceive as like, well, that's what it should be. Well, does it have to be? Start good at that with naturalists asking the hard questions. What if it was this? Could it be this? And so trying to, to sell that vision. And also more broadly, when you think of native plants, and it is a true, uh, a lot of the plants we have at the plant sales in our gardens are forbs. So those are flowering plants. However, uh, also uh, kind of from Doug Tallamy's uh, talk is we think about uh, these plants, uh, you know, a lot of times as flowers, but uh, our trees and shrubs, all these different things are useful for a wild, uh, wide range uh, of wildlife. Uh, and so these are kind of our, our different types uh, of plants. Uh, Doug talks a lot about uh, the utility and usefulness of oak trees that uh, there probably isn't uh, a native tree with more kind of uh, symbiotic connections, animals that use them uh, than an oak, all the way from the different parts of the, the acorns, all the insects that use the acorns, the mammals, even birds like blue jays love acorns, to all the many different you know, species of moths that uh, will lay their eggs, will eat the leaves, which of course interact, uh, in kind attract the birds to eat the insects. So it all kind of builds there off of uh, the plants. And so we have listed there at the top in some of the pictures, uh, some of our kind of main uh, uh, types of tree families that have kind of the biggest connections, especially yeah, those moths. You know, always think of them. They're kind of like the, the kind of like the, uh, the redheaded, the stepchild for, for butterflies. Butterflies love moths are kind of brown. And, but uh, so many uh, moths uh, are, uh, are eaten by, uh, by birds and are uh, a big part of the ecosystem. And then kind of Further on down there and on the right side there, we do have uh, those different kind of uh, types of flowering plant families, uh, the goldenrods, uh, the asters, uh, sunflowers, uh, a lot of those and many of our uh, plants available are kind of mid to late season uh, bloomers, uh, especially this time of the year, you can see a lot of those uh, native plants and uh, can even talk about, uh, we have uh, those different types of flowering plants that have different uses that some of them are kind of wide open, like the goldenrod or the sunflower are kind of a generalist. Anybody can come and pollinate those plants, any type of insect. Sometimes the bees, flies, wasps, even bees are best adapted. And there's other ones that kind of have the like cardinal flower kind of tubular plants or ones that only kind of certain species can get into. So you have that kind of a variety possibly in your yard or in uh, your habitat. And then kind of beyond uh, kind of the, our native forbs and our kind of trees and into some of the other uh, plants. Now we're getting a little bit into the, of course, the weeds, I have to say, with plants. Uh, and some of these, though, are, uh, are pretty neat into uh, kind of uh, attracting different animals, birds, uh, things to your yards. Uh, on the uh, kind of the left side there, upper left, we have a spice bush. Again, I mentioned, uh, me haven't had good luck with, with spice bush, but uh, on different seasons, there's different uses. So during the, the kind of the, the summer season where we have the main kind of our foliage and our leaves, the spice bush swallowtail butterfly amongst other species can chew uh, on the leaves. And it might sound you know, kind of like uh, anathema to gardeners like, oh, I don't want the insects chewing on my leaves. I wanna get them off there, I wanna, I wanna spray them off. Um, However, for uh, for the native gardener, oftentimes that's that's good. It's like the opposite. Like, yes, I want the want the wildlife to come eat it. And a lot of times, uh, your native plants are like they're okay with. They're adapted for being chewed on. They'll kind of be able to, to bounce back from that. But so we have the foliage. Then we have the uh, berries there, which are high in protein and fat. 
which right that the people are like oh, fat that, that's not good if you're a migrating bird that is good i'm expending all this energy so i want lots of protein and fat there uh, compared to some of our other uh, our, our invasive shrubs they're actually higher in sugar uh, also delicious the birds still love to eat them just not good for them uh, yes so good to have uh, uh, more of that uh, spice bush and native plants uh, and then in the springtime uh, it can be difficult to have to find flowers for your landscape uh, in our earlier bloomers. Our spring ephemerals are notoriously difficult to kind of cultivate and are, are, are tough uh, to grow. But our shrubs are nice. They have those little kind of flowers there uh, in the springtime. So shrubs can be great kind of throughout the season. And even grasses, talk about, oh, grasses, they're, they're bad. You said that, you know, turf grass, not good. But right on the upper right there, we have uh, blue stem grass there. And so it does actually, in uh, even the... Uh, Grasses will flower, we have these little kind of yellow dangly things, and they have uh, these kind of colorful uh, kind of seeds, uh, and they can be uh, a part there of the planting and can attract, you know, grasshoppers, be a nice uh, cover for birds, and even birds eating the seeds, uh, insects eating the seeds, even mammals uh, sometimes. And then sedges, uh, some of them are pretty well adapted for wetter areas. Birds uh, sometimes will use uh, parts of the plant for nests. Uh, a nice uh, ground cover, uh, yes, uh, in insects using them, all these different plants uh, as well. So yes, yeah, something that you can incorporate in the last uh, couple of slides, talk about kind of the, your yard kind of generally kind of attracting wildlife, even kind of beyond the plants, as well as some more considerations uh, for both uh, the people, the soil, uh, the light, things uh, like that. So yes, some other things that you might consider, we've got that, so now we're getting kind of nerdy on you there on the left side. We've got our, our, our soil pyramid and at the top, we've got the clay down the left, we've got the sand, the silt and all different. So yeah, it, it, it's, a, I mean, it can be sort of complex. It really, it's all just, it, it's dirt. And there are things that dirt does make a difference on what likes to grow in it. So I, I shouldn't dismiss it too much that it's just dirt. But yeah, what the plants grow out of, we have the clay, it really likes to hold on to water. So maybe some of your cardinal flower and, and things that are adapted for wet. Um, there's other things uh, like the, um, uh, it's very sandy. Uh, there that's very well drained. The uh, blue lupin really likes that sandy soil. If you put it in clay, it'll do all right till its root gets down to that, that hard clay and it'll be like, nope. Um, so, so yes, uh, having the right type of plant for your right type of soil will give it the best chance uh, to have success and, and thrive uh, in your yard. Um, yes, and uh, also with the uh, your soil type, you can do uh, at home tests. You can even connect uh, when I resource with uh, Lucas County Soil and Water can help kind of help you establish. I, mean, like, I don't know what's in my yard. It's, it's dirt. I don't know what how much water is to hold on. You can do uh, kind of soil uh, testing to see how long water takes to kind of run through during a certain period of time. You can also just ask the folks. Yeah, it's uh, Lucas County, Wood County, whatever your county soil and water district can help you kind of. Uh, you can bring them some of your dirt and they can help you out with that. And even colors uh, in design, uh, yard size. I know this is one. This is one I, I do run into a little bit of trouble sometimes. Some of your plants are really happy. They're really big, and they start growing up really tall, you kind know, of falling over towards your neighbor's yard, and kind of like almost into their driveway. Yeah, that's like my plants, but maybe it's a little bit overkill, and they're like flopping onto their onto their fence. And I will say that it's still on, on my side, but even like there's some against the fence. They're kind of like leering at the, <laughs> at the yard, like. Like, eh, they're still on my side. They're propped up against the fence. So, yes, they're, they're okay with it. But who knows? Maybe, maybe your uh, your neighbors don't like your leering plants. They're over there, and and your neighbors or even someone in your household's like, but it's native plants. They're lovely. Like, no, no, no. I don't. I don't like these native plants. I I like my hostas and everything. My my grass mode to you know an inch and a half. Uh, so it is something uh, uh, to consider. Uh, something to consider, you know, um, other things. I, I know uh, Barry was saying that uh, he's about to uh, assume the, the presidency, besides being the state of naturalist president of the Homeowner Association. But this is great news. He also mentioned that they were advocating there in the Oak Openings region, and they were advocating for native plants, which is spectacular. So there's kind of a growing kind of awareness, like, yeah, you can do this. But sometimes there are rules. I know that uh, I, I read news stories about uh, some folks running into some trouble with homeowner associations about what you can, what the rules are. So it's good to check in before you like have your, your whole thriving native native lawn, your neighbor like quietly mentions to the homeowner association like, oh, you're right, look up the bylaws, your plants are too high. So 
Maybe you can find some lower growing ones that uh, yeah, are still meeting their needs. So it, it, uh, it is a little bit of a dance. You don't want to, you know, be completely dismissive of it. It's kind of a balance. So you also don't necessarily want to have them, you know, might push back a little bit or like try to do some of the storytelling. Well, the reason I'm excited about this are these things. I don't want to completely be a pushover. Like, okay, fine. But yeah, it, it's good to have those considerations in mind to be mindful and not just kind of like run roughshod over people like i don't care what you think usually doesn't go uh too well and that last point about uh what you're trying to uh, attract uh, to your yard um i know that again mentioning rick whose yard i visited i even came home with some, some plants we'll get to that that the native plant community sometimes you visit a person's yard you see their garden get some ideas they're like i have way too much you know of, of this and you just come home with plants oh that's that's great but um, he mentioned that he has specific uh, plants. I'm trying to remember, Kim, what is the giant swallowtail uh, plant, a tree, ash? Ash, I think it might have been, yeah. Prickly ash, I think I think Rick did put in, uh, I think it was prickly ash. And he's like, I put this prickly ash just so to see if I could get giant swallowtails to come uh, to the yard. So sometimes just like, I really want to bring all these different, I know like the host plant for some of these creatures. A lot of times it's more kind of general, like an oak, like you have a lot of things, but sometimes I really want giant swallow tails. I wanna see if I can get them to the yard. Um, I know I've been, I've been Facebook stalking Kim, like I want to have a water feature. I want to see if I can attract dragonflies, which is great. So maybe you have a thing like, I really like a I love dragonflies. I want to see if I can get them to the yard. Sure enough, I can, I can do it. So it kind of depends. Maybe I really love hummingbirds. I want to, you know, plant, uh, the cardinal flower or different tubular plants. So it kind of depends on what you'd like to see in your yard. And all those things for me, kind of as being the naturalist thing, seeing the birds, I just kind of really like to have like a, a variety of things and see how many different, which is kind of often a goal for, for parks. You want kind of like a, a diverse assemblage. I want things that like many different animals could use. So that, that's kind of what I'm interested, in. but it kind of all, all those things and ways of being, those are all great things. And yeah, so here's the, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but it is kind of overwhelming. All, all the plants, this is kind of a, a starting uh, list. Um, I'm trying to remember, this might even, Kim, is this on the Wild Ones site? I, I stole it, yes, I did, I knew it, I remember. Yes, which is good, actually, yeah, we're stealing. We're all, we're all rowing in the same direction, so it's not, it's not stealing, it's, it's sharing, we're sharing. And so, uh, yes, it's there uh, on the website, so we have, Right, all these different plants. And it's kind of a general ideas. Like I said, sometimes if you really want things to work, be like, I'm just gonna water it every single day. I'm gonna make this thing grow. It, it, sometimes it takes more work. It's, it's usually easier when you're like, this is happy where it's supposed to be, where it's wet, or it doesn't want to be wet. It needs to be more upland. You know, like with, with, I try to put my butterfly milkweed kind of like at the edges of the rain, not right in the middle where it's gonna get all the water. Uh, and it, it seems to like it better on the, on the periphery, up on the higher and drier areas. But uh, yeah, that's a nice uh, a nice list there of uh, plants. And like you said, you can find that if, you, if you're trying to take a picture or like, oh no, go back. You can file, uh, find it Wild Ones. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll share their, their website. Actually, I have it at the end there. And then kind of for the last couple slides and talking kind of about the general kind of idea of native plants, um, I'm pretty sure I used this from, this is oh, a Doug Tallamy, uh, uh, kind of a part of his uh, presentation as well. The kind of the, the traditional versus the, the native gardening. So on the top, we have more of a traditional uh, um, kind of a gardening uh, mindset, which is not without uh, merit. It, it's still gardening uh, is healthy, good for you, still adds value to uh, the environment, you know, again, more than the lawn, but maybe high, more uh, heavily weighted toward decorative and, you know, kind of uh, how things look, which to, to the native plant, still very important. Uh, a big part of, you know, we want to look nice and be decorative, but then you have a couple other, a little bit more limited decorative value, some screening from the neighbors or from a windscreen, things like that. And then kind of towards the bottom, that kind of uh, the idea of kind of the native garden, uh, we're a little bit more broad in thinking about things. Um, you know, I'm looking at, like I mentioned, my like the food web, all the different animals that are going to use it. Uh, with the rain garden, I'm trying to maybe uh, capture some of that runoff uh, to help out in a small way, uh, just a little bit to help uh, some of that runoff from going right into the storm drains to help maybe some of our water quality improve uh, a bit. And I know that uh, from thanks to Hal Mann 
uh, who's another Wild Ones member who does a great uh, rain garden presentation. He was talking about even uh, a collection of rain gardens in the neighborhood they did a study was a measurable difference. You might think, oh, what, how much can that little rain garden do? When you put a lot of them together, uh, together, you, it can make uh, a measurable difference uh, looking at the research. Uh, and yes, and I'll, I won't go through them all, but all those different kind of things uh, that kind of uh, that a native garden uh, can add. And yes, um, on the education awareness part, uh, my wife, uh, she's good at, yes, uh, uh, researching, ordering things. She ordered uh, a, a picture, so or a picture, a, a sign, a sign for the garden, which is pretty important. Some people walk by and are like, what? In fact, I think the mailman was like, man, eh, it's too bad that your pond never filled in those. <laughs> I did like, oh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's okay. But um, so and she has, it's just a little rain garden. It has a couple of sentences or two about like what it's doing. And so when you have that like narrative, you're not there to be like, oh, hello, is this a rain garden? It does these things. People just kind of like walk by like, oh, that's weird. Oh, it's doing a thing. I like it now. Okay. So, so yeah, and maybe even recruit a couple of people to, uh, yeah, to join you uh, in that. And then kind of more broadly, even kind of like in addition to your plants, um, yeah, talking about the top there, uh, bloom time, uh, one of the, they talk about in kind of native garden is trying to have plants throughout the season. So you have something blooming all the way from kind of earlier in the springtime, which again, I know it is trickier to get those plants all the way through here, the end, we're getting close to the end towards the frost um, of October, that you have plants blooming for even the earliest, you know, emerging insects and pollinators in the springtime all the way through towards frost when you're losing some of those adult insects. A water source can be uh, can be good. It might be, you know, a, a, a bubbler, a little kind of fountain like that. Um, it might be a full kind of like waterscape, but uh, having a water source good for birds, also good even for insects. You can always think about like bees drink water. They do. They'll come in and even uh, if you want to get uh, kind of into it, sometimes uh, they've talked about they can Come to the water they can even drown in the water so you need to put little rocks in there to help them kind of like go up on there I, i've tried to try to do that but um yeah so an idea um host plants so that bottom uh, picture so explain what's going on there you might be like what on earth is happening that is uh the camouflage looper um moth caterpillar called uh, yeah uh, yeah the camouflage looper yeah that's it the uh, adult after it goes through its metamorphosis called the wavy lined emerald remembered that um, yes, and so it actually takes parts of either blooms or leaves and it camouflages itself uh, as a kind of as the plant. And I found a couple of these in my yard, which is I, I just I thought that was spectacular. So uh, yes, uh, having different host plants for different species of moth or butterfly, um, and having cover uh, that could be uh, another thing. In the upper uh, right there, we have a fox on a, a trail cam there that uh, you can have. Uh, your little brush piles and different kind of areas. Uh, even, um, uh, I know that uh, you might not try this in the front yard, but they talk about leaving your fall leaves, uh, kind of uh, raking them to the periphery of your yard. And it was amazing. I had a story about that. I was watching some juncos. Usually they're a bird that comes like in the fall and stays through the wintertime, leaves in the spring for areas further north. And I was watching it kind of, you know, it's, you know, out the window. And sure enough, at the edge of the fence there, it grabbed out of the leaf layers of December, like long past, like caterpillar season. It grabbed a big green caterpillar out of that leaf layer. I'm like, what? Whoa, they were right. There's stuff hiding in there for them, them to eat. So, uh, so yeah, uh, another kind of is trying to add this uh, slide about adding value just kind of uh, for wildlife in your yard, even beyond uh, the plants. And yes, on the last slide or two, yes, there she is. I, actually, I didn't know that you were going to be here. Didn't know you were going to be here today. But yes, there, there she is. She, she made the presentation. That's, that's, uh, that's Kim uh, up there and Kate. Um, yes, and they're holding plants because there it is. I got that graphic. Thanks, Kate, for um, the, the plant sale, the Wild Ones plant sale. I, I did a terrible job of, I planned uh, for another, our fall uh, plant sale at the parks. Um, it's tonight. <laughs> you missed it, <laughs> but you came here to learn about it, which was just great. And you still have a, another opportunity. So the plant sale there, that's at the Blue Creek uh, Seed Nursery, which is at Blue Creek Metro Park out in White House. And uh, yes, another pitch for, uh, uh, might not be able to see it, kind of small print. I, might, I shrunk down the picture, but while once members, you can become a member, there's a pre-sale. And that is uh, members of the uh, friends of the Wood County Parks, our plant sales, they get a, a sneak peek, the choicest, best plants. 
And so, yes, if you become a member, you get an hour there of perusing free of all the other marauding hordes of people who want plants. And actually, it comes like, actually, no, it is like that. There's lots of <laughs> people trying to shut the door down. They have to have the rangers on duty to, to, to organize the, the chaos. So, you know, people, not too many sharp elbows being thrown uh, for the for the plants. But um Yes, and what's kind of exciting about this, uh, I, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, is this the first Wild Ones fall sale? Fall. Yeah, the first fall sale, which um, our, our um, uh, stewardship specialist in Wood County Parks, Tanya Jennings, just had a program. There it seems there's a lot of emphasis, which is which is good. It's great on spring planting, kind of start stuff is starting to crop up and get green and bloom. The fall, everything's kind of, you know, finishing up for the year. It's like, nah. but actually a great time to plant. Uh, and one of the reasons why, and just I'm not necessarily an expert on it, but um, they get as the plants get established in the fall, even over the winter time, even though they look like you're planting like a dead stick, like this doesn't this isn't going to end up well. But sure enough, um, they kind of establish themselves over the winter time, um, and so they're pretty well established uh, for uh, starting out in the springtime. Well, you can run into a little bit sometimes in the spring, like this spring. You, you, it's May, and you're like, okay, nice and cool, nice cool May. Put your plant in the ground all of a sudden it's 90 degrees doesn't rain for like three weeks and so that's when even native plants that can be a trouble for them especially starting out so fall can be a good time to plant native you can also do springtime too generally may you know good time pretty so pretty wet uh can be a little bit stressful sometimes going through the summer if it gets kind of droughty trying to stay on top of that and so yes um there is also a spring wild one sale also uh at, at blue creek that is during uh, the blue week there of uh, mid-May. Sorry, if I look at the calendar, you'll probably even pick out when it is. But mid-May, uh, the Wood County Parks have a plant sale the weekend before. So that is often the time, but some more uh, right fall sales as well. And in terms of getting uh, the plants, um, I just learned uh, another one, uh, uh, Liv's Native Nursery. So Liv, uh, Olivia there was a student inspired by native plants at the University of Toledo, <clears throat> was so excited about it. She's like, I here up on a farm. I'm going to have them sell this my idea to my parents. We're going to have a native plant uh, nursery. So I just saw it was interesting. I was riding through Old Orchard in West Toledo and I saw that sign. I'm like, what's going on? I don't know anything about that. So, uh, so yeah, another uh, resource uh, for plants. Um, yeah, SJ Natural uh, Design. That is uh, Sonia Jennings, uh, one of our Wood County Park staff who um, can help. She just likes to, even when she's her non work time, likes to visit people's yards and help them. She's so excited about it, just does it on her own. And so I would say like in terms of uh, the best sources, like wild ones, the Wood County Parks, uh, all sources maybe aren't quite created equal. We have something called like kind of local genotype where you have local seeds that are adapted for this area. So you might have, give me an idea, we might have uh, some seeds or a plant, one from like Wisconsin and one from Northwest Ohio that is blooming at different times, is best adapted for Northwest Ohio. And so I would say those are the top. We also do have other kind of native plant. You have kind of these catalogs or other larger nurseries, uh, Prairie Moon, uh, Prairie Nursery. North Branch is out of Pemberville. Again, a little bit of a larger nursery who's kind of growing their, uh, their native plant uh, collection and can even do some help in kind of uh, organizing your yard. You do have kind of have to ask them. They're a little bit more kind of growing out of a traditional landscaping, but are kind of learning as more people our, our, the market is increasing. People are interested and they're kind of like, oh, okay. So they can help if you say, I want native plants. I want you to help me with native plants. Not, you know. so, uh, so yeah, something can be helpful at North Branch as well as um, right, uh, Wild Ones website can help with design. And another one there, I was doing the research, I was wondering, what, when are their meetings? Wild Ones, uh, Oak Openings Chapter, which Wild Ones is a native plant advocacy organization that's nationwide, but we have our local chapter Wild Ones, Oak Openings Region, you can attend their meetings, you can become a member even better, but you can also attend their meetings like Toledo Naturalist, become a member of Toledo Naturalist, you can come to the, to the programs, the field trips, but they meet the second Tuesday, seven o'clock at Olander Park. You got it. Yeah. So, so, and some, except when it's on Zoom. So go, go to their website. If you're not sure, go to wildones.org. Uh, yes, or Wild Ones, Oak, or Oak Openings Region. Wild Ones. Wild ones, oak openings that work. Yes. Right. It is a very good resource because I ha and, and they, they are well connected. Uh, they are right to all, you know, uh, Metro Parks, Wood County Parks, all the different uh, plant sales. Uh, yes. 
And uh, yeah, so more about getting connected. Um, our volunteer naturalist, uh, the OCBN Central Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, that's a good uh, program that we have different chapters, with Wood County Parks, Metro Parks, uh, Toledo, Lucas County, um, or Master Gardener programs uh, in uh, your county. Yeah, volunteering, Wood County Parks, Metro Parks, Toledo uh, can be a good way. Uh, sometimes you can even, at our parks, you can come help out in the greenhouse, you walk away with a plant or two. You visit Rick's yard, you visit Kim's yard, we have so many plants, you, you might walk away uh, with some. Uh, or uh, again, uh, Toledo Naturals uh, Association, you can come on programs, field trips, learn more uh, about plants. Uh, coming to Wild Ones also does their own programs going out into the field, visiting uh, places. Uh, and yes, kind of uh, uh, last and last slide or two, um, the impact uh, of doing this, at least uh, for me anyway, there's certainly a wildlife impact. And I can't say that I have, you know, I'm not necessarily like creating a rare, lovely habitat that's going to attract like, you know, globally rare, even though I, I'm on the periphery of the Oak Openings region, it does have globally rare creatures. I'm probably not going to, you know, attract something highly rare. But I do know for certain, if my plants weren't there, there wouldn't be these creatures. They would not be there. So that's kind of, that's pretty exciting to me. And really, uh, I have to say, uh, it is sort of, yeah, again, one of those dad hobby things. Like, I really like to wander around. Actually, I like to wander the yard so much that I'll come home. I won't even get in the house, be wandering the yard. And it's becoming enough of the thing. My wife's like, could you like come and see me first before like, you'll get home and like 45 minutes later, like, all right. What? Oh, there he is out the window looking at the plants. So I mean, one of people passing by as I'm like looking up close. Is he talking? To, what's he doing? <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I really uh, enjoy it. And yes, trying to get the kids again. Um, I, I can't necessarily say that um, I converted them into like future naturalists or nature nuts. But I, I hope like just, just through like absorption, they're like, that was a goofy thing dad did. And I kind of enjoyed it with him in, in a certain kind of way. So that's Natalie. Oh, uh, we, we had some, we had some monarchs there that we were raising. Uh, that got to be, that can be a lot of work. Decided to go out of that. <laughs> Doing the monarchs just too much. So we just kind of let them go in, into, in the yard. And also that last one, uh, yes, um, sometimes it can be, you know, all the considerations, the sun, the shade, the soil type, it can be kind of complex, but ultimately sometimes just like, you just gotta go for it. Just kind of, just, just go and uh, go and do it. Come to the plant sale. You know, just grab some plants, talk to Kim and people, they can help you out um, and other gardeners. And that's really what I did. I, uh, before I put in that rain garden, I visit Rick Barraclo's yard. I got some plants. I talked to Marilyn Dufour with the city of Toledo. She came out to my yard, was like, I'm thinking about doing this. Does this sound good? Yeah, yeah, I think it could work. So, okay, good. I'm gonna start digging up the yard. Um, yeah, yeah. And then uh, finally, uh, a couple of resources. So you have this resources uh, page that uh, NWF, National Wildlife Federation, Xerxes Society, uh, some uh, native garden designs, basically. So you know, don't have to copy that all down. Uh, though the, we are recorded, you can uh, find it on Zoom again since we're recording it. But um, uh, Toledo uh, Wild Ones, uh, Wild Ones uh, uh, has uh, native garden design. I think Toledo Zoo also has uh, both sale and design uh, there. Uh, yes, put in the, again, wild ones, fall plant sale there. And then at the end there, Mark Witt, who I worked with, uh, with Division of Natural Resources, if you have like big acres or like, I have lots of acres, more than just like putting in some plants, like uh, he can visit your yard and kind of advise you on maybe plant mixes or, you know, uh, even he sometimes works with farmers that maybe they have an area that's very kind of soggy, things won't grow in it. They have a conservation reserve program where you can just put in you know, maybe plants that are uh, adapted for, for wildlife can be helpful that way. So if you have lots of acreage, uh, Mark uh, and uh, ODNR, Division of Natural Resources in Ohio, can be helpful uh, that way. And then another pitch for uh, Doug Tallamy, uh, some books to kind of read more about it. Um, Bringing Nature Home um, is, uh, that was his uh, first book? Yes. And Nature's Best Hope, he followed that up with, with another book. And it's just really talking a lot about uh, yes, having uh, native plants and their importance in your uh, landscape. And also for folks that uh, we talk about this, uh, like the uh, Midwestern native garden, non uh, native alternative to non-native flowers. Maybe you really love, you know, whatever, like you're like, you know, you don't have to be sobbing while you rip out, you know, grandma's heritage roses. Ah, I'm so sorry. Like maybe you keep those and you just incorporate native plants 
uh, somewhere else, or you have something you really like, but it's kind of invasive, or I'll take that out, but I really liked it. Maybe you could find an alternative to it. So there's some resources uh, there towards uh, replacing them. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, I, I should say, uh, as we finish the presentation, sorry for the folks tantalizing you on Zoom, but uh, we do have uh, Mike, our field trip chair, is kind enough to bring snacks. You can stick around. We also do have uh, tiles. Ah, I got them for Zoom. Yes, we have tiles here. You can also, uh, Alan, do we have those on the website? I think at our last board meeting. Yeah, we have a way if you really like, oh, 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 if I'm doing this right. Uh, oh, John, wait, no, no, John's not here anymore, our Zoom master. But yes, so uh, with our, our tiles, our commemorative uh, tiles there, uh, nice that, uh, yes, you can uh, find those on our website, truthnaturalist.org, and they're for sale. Wish you were here, glad you're on Zoom. But uh, uh, yes, oh, and um, yes, any, any questions? Uh, yeah. Good deal. I, I'm also, I'm trying to look, I'm trying to look out here and, um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, if, if I give you my email, can you yeah. send me the link to your talk? Uh, yes, yes, we can do that because we've, we've recorded uh, the Zoom link. Um, I think it'll even, uh, it'll be posted. I could also send it to you. We could send it to you with John. We could send it to you directly to like okay. refer back to. You. Ah, you yes. And we can send you the link directly uh, too, yes. Um, and um, yeah, I'm looking at, yes, I, I love, uh, I'm looking back at the comments. Uh, Kathy on, on Zoom was like, it's cardinal flower. Yes, that, that first one. Um, yes, and um, uh, right, Tajinder was saying that, uh, yes, I planted the cardinal flower, enjoying the hummingbirds in his yard. Yes, yes. So it, it's pretty neat. It's kind of amazing that way, how you put stuff in and you're like, eh, I don't know. It does, sometimes it does take, uh, you know, a little bit of time to establish. You might not get blooms. Like it, it can be, you have to a little bit of uh, a patience. Sometimes that can be difficult for both people planting them as well as like when the garden gets established that people are like, it just looks like green weeds. What's going on there? And then yeah, as it starts to bloom out, yes, you're more excited. Yeah, very. Don't you usually figure three to four years? For yeah. Of maturity? Yeah, I would say I, I really, it, it seems like and kind of uh, with the rain garden, I think it's about year four, it, you can really see it kind of filling in. And I'm also noticing uh, this, especially in year four, that a lot of the plant seeds, they're just popping up as like weeds enough that I'm like, I don't want you there. I'm going to put you over here. And kind of to the point right where you're like, I think I have enough plants I can like dig them up and share them. It was like popping up like in the middle of the lawn. I don't, I don't want to mow. I don't want to mow that cornflower over. I want to, I want to, I want to dig it out. I want to like, I want to give it to someone or put it over here. <laughs> I'm almost getting to the point where like, where do I, where do I put it? Does my wife want to take? No, probably shouldn't dig up more lawn. I already have enough lawn. Kids need somewhere to play in our yard, and so it's kind of like, yeah, I need to give them to somebody because they're they're just kind of popping up here. And they're even like, and they're amazing. Some of them like out of the cracks of the sidewalks. You think like, yeah, there goes some New England aster. You're like. Ah, they, they really are good at this thing. Yes. So on that topic, um, aside from the like wood coming in into some plant exchanges, are, do you know of any, or do any of you know of any native plant exchanges specifically? Oh, like I have yeah. seeds that I'm saving and yeah. have to see trade. And yes, yes. Um, you know, there is, um, there is, and you're probably familiar with this one, there is a seed exchange. Um, I'm trying to remember who that is through. It's not specific though. Is it Toledo Grows? Yes, thank you. It's through Toledo Grows, um, and they have a seed exchange. But it's not. I don't think that we have. Do we have anything like a native? Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. So yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned or, or repeated the question on Zoom. It was about exchange of native seeds and going to the seed exchange. Wild Ones has uh, seeds uh, exchange, the seed exchange, which is in February, I feel like, yeah. winter time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, Toledo grows in the, in the seed exchange and also have seeds coming up October 7th, 11 to 4. <laughs> yes, yes, at the Wild Ones plant sale, October 7th, yes, Sunday, yes. Yeah. I have a question about butterflies. So if you can't answer it, maybe there's something. Yes, yes, it's likely. <laughs> I've had um, 
parsley plant hanging on my red wall. Mm. Earlier this year, I had some tent fillers, and yeah. I didn't take close enough attention, and then they all just disappeared. Now, yeah. the last week to 10 days, I've had four, and I've been watching them mm. morning, noon, and night. <laughs> they were there this morning. What are the odds that all four of them decide to leave on the same day, or am I looking at a predator? Mm. They're all laid on the same day. Yeah, yeah. Sure what all this the same they all too. look the same. And, the, and what they had done is yeah. curly leaf, the flat leaf, parsley, and it's on the hanging, it's a hanging yeah. herb garden. And yeah. they roll yeah. out towards the end of the plant. Mm -hmm. Are they dropped? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so we we're talking about right on, on parsley, and I think the folks are, I'm thinking those are probably black swallowtails. Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, and um, it, it is kind of amazing that they, they do can disappear like that. Sometimes it can be predators, it can be predators. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is something that's amazing. Yeah, any number of things. There's so even. <laughs> I've, I've watched that uh, monarch butterfly or caterpillars. And it's amazing for right, they have like a, a chemical defense with what they get from their plant. It's just amazing how many things nab them. I was watching a predatory stink bug. They were just like murdering every last one. They just nothing wanted to get up. And they just poke their beak into them and yeah, suck them up. Oh yeah, in, in the uh, yeah with, with some of the swallowtail caterpillars, they have these. Yeah, the little orange, little orange things yeah. that kind of make up either are scary to look scary at, right. are scary to look at, or have a weird smell. But yeah. yes, between the birds, the like, there's plenty of wasp uh, uh, that like will lay their eggs. Oh, in yeah, so many predators. Away. Right. Just, yes, bring them back into their burrows. Uh, yeah. The, yes. Right. Yes, yes, wasp, uh, um, right, bees, uh, and again, that, that's even, that can be a confusing one, wasp versus bee, um, it, right, in, in the storytelling about, uh, especially people are like, that's, why do you want so many flowers, they're bees, all the bees, like, yeah, I, I want them, and I, I was even showing my neighbor, I was like, look, you can even pet the bumblebees, like, <laughs> you can touch them, or even the wasps, you know, they're, they're more aggressive, for sure, I, I don't pet the, the wasps, but <laughs> when, when they're pollinating, when they're on the flowers, like, if I'm up by their nest, like, that, yeah, that, that's, that, I'm gonna get, every time but when they're on the flowers i can even look at the wasps up close and they're just like eh, okay but so so yeah definitely different when the bees are doing their thing it, it really does take a lot to annoy them because they're just they're, they're working okay what's this guy sometimes I'll, I'll pet them you know when they're sleeping really like, i'll put their legs up like, what's, what's going on so so yeah but but it, it is something that's like it's kind of different for people that are like conditioned from an early age like bees bees they're gonna they're gonna get me here's thing like I mean, they can. I, I can't tell them like you'll never be stung by a bee. But yeah, relative to like rel relative threat to like all your flowers, like yeah, there there it's not it's not too much of a of an issue there. Yeah. So, so I know I think you said so yes. bees, but so lots of bees on your on your rainforest. Yeah. Like lots of bees. Yes. So yes. True. Do the kids get acclimated? Do they? I mean, when they're when the, when the bees are there. Yeah. Yeah, I think he said, I think, yeah, yeah, I think the kids are okay, and, and they're from an anxious family. Uh, <laughs> yes, and one, and one that is very, uh, very uh, aware of various threats, including including the, the bees. You can tell family stories about bees and diving through car windows rather than opening the door. That's a, in family lore. But yeah, I think so. I think he's done enough processing because he, he's been stung. It'd be some of the anxiety which triggers that he's been stung multiple times by yellow jackets but i think he's kind of like he, he's processed that, tra you know, that trauma and he's like okay the yellow jackets i need to be aware of them they definitely when, when they come this time of the year in the late summer and they they are aggressive getting at your food he doesn't they don't like that no, no, nobody 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 likes to be harassed by the yellow jackets but i think for for the bees like they're like oh okay in this context like I'm okay. Uh, I'm not okay with the L Jack is trying to eat my hamburger or get my pop. That's always a bummer. But um, again, and they're just doing, they're being a wasp. They're doing what they do. They eat sugary and, and meaty things like we do. But uh, yes, problematic uh, in, in the backyard. So yes, to answer that question on the kids, I think I think that they're, they're good with, um, yes, with, with the bees and doing their thing, but not with the yellow jackets. They're not good with those. That's like in the house right away. So 
So, yes, they are. It, it is. If you, they, it's uh, like a field of dreams thing. If you put them in there, they will come. They, they, they will come. It's amazing how they, how they find, yeah, how they find them. It is like they're all, they're all over the place and just, yeah, covered, covered and all kind of little tiny sweat bees and the leaf cutter bees. And I even, I even learned this not too long ago. You think, you know, I should have known this as a professional, but like with mulch and mulch can be good for holding on moisture, but even using leaf mulch, because that's where the bees go into uh, to, to nest. And again, for people who are like, do you want them to nest in your yard? What, what are you talking about? Like, you don't want, you don't want bees. I'm like, no, I want them to nest. I want them that the solitary bees go into the ground and they can't get through the mulch. It's like too, too hard. And I still use mulch sometimes in actual hardwood mulch, but a lot of times just putting the, the leaves on there. And uh, yeah, it, it can almost like help sometimes to, to be in, in the city. I feel like I get by, not that my neighbors are like big nature people. I just don't think they don't care. I don't care too much. Like, yeah, he's doing something over there. It's fine. So, so yeah, it, it works out. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. I, I'm, uh, uh, ah, oh, okay. So, let's see. I'm trying to, um, see. Oh, uh, okay. And so I'm trying to look at a couple, a uh, couple things from Zoom. Do deer devour, devour the uh, cardinal flower? Oh, um, the deer ate, uh, let's see, New Guinea impatience. I don't know that one. Um, you know, I don't, I'm guessing they might, they haven't eaten my car flower. I'm right in the middle of West Toledo. Cardinal flower and yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose deer, they like to mow things down if it is. Uh, you know, you know what though, and you might know that it's deer, Kathy. Um, the main thing that I have, of course, I'm in West Toledo. We still do have deer coming through West Toledo too, but rabbits. Rabbits are the one that they, they're voraciously, sometimes even to the point, usually when your plants mature enough that, that they won't bother them, but trying to get my plants started, I tried to transplant a, uh, a, a spider wart. It just, every time, just like, didn't, uh, yes, uh, didn't uh, get it. Oh, yeah. And I, I see there's a, sorry, there's a, there's another message there. I think I'm, I'm missing from Kathy, but I'll see if I can um, find that one. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm glad to, uh, yeah, I'm glad to have you. Glad to have you on Zoom and glad to have you in person. And uh, yes, thanks so much for, uh, for coming out. Appreciate it.